Happy Monday and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes and because it's Monday, that means I'm joined by Will Salatan on uh, today's podcast. So Will, did you have a good weekend? I, I did, except that I kind of wished I was in Wisconsin, Charlie, because uh, it's like 90 degrees here. Now now it's better today, but it's a miserable weekend. Okay, well, it, it's a little bit cooler here, I have, to, I have to say, but it was very, very, very pleasant. And because it's pleasant and because I'm kind of in a Monday mood, could we disagree not to talk about monkeypox? I'm sorry, I don't want to talk about I, I have no bandwidth for monkeypox. I just yeah, can't you, do it. I can't. You know, Charlie, you may be sick of monkeypox, but monkeypox is not done with you. I am, you know what? I'm just, I just, I'll, let's just wait on this. It's it's <laughs> sort of like, it's, I don't know, it's it's like waiting for the new season. Let's like, okay, when are they going to drop the new season? Okay, we're done with, we're done with COVID. Not really, but we've, we've lost interest in COVID and now, and now it's monkeypox. Whatever happened to those scary spiders or bees or something? I mean, it's just like every once in a while, there's something that let's get frightened about it. And then like a week later, we go, OK, was that a thing or not? Right. I don't know. Right. It is a law of nature that some menace like spiders or a virus will come in to fill the it's news. True. Vacuum. Which is true. Then the question is whether or not we have enough bandwidth to talk about it on the on the podcast. So, I mean, I'm not saying that the monkey pox is not a is not a thing. I'm just gonna, I'm I'm going to wait. And as you pointed out before we started, uh, people haven't chosen sides yet on monkeypox, but just wait. Right. I mean, is there any chance that monkeypox will not be politicized? Of course it will be. And the the reason- Thank you, Joe Biden. (laughs) The reason, Charlie- This is what you get for your porous border and bringing in all those monkeys, right? Right. But the reason, of course, that it will be politicized is that we are the virus. Humans are the virus. We will find a way to take anything in nature out, no matter how bad it is, and make it worse by fighting about it and tearing each other's hair out. You know, I, I wanted to be offended by that, but I just can't be. It's just, that's that's true. We have to fess up for it. Okay, so I want to talk about a lot of things, including a little bit of schadenfreude uh, for what's happening, anticipatory schadenfreude about the shellacking of Donald Trump in Georgia tomorrow. I want to talk about that a little bit because I do think that is kind of interesting. Uh, we, we do have some, like, modestly good news. We also have some, you know, horrifically bad news. The American right partying, and this is not a this is not a parody, by the way. The American right partying in Hungary with Viktor Orban, uh, sort of the fascist adjacent uh, nationalist leader of, of Hungary, and President Trump appears there, and of course Tucker Carlson, and various conspiracy theories, and apparently a very notorious Hungarian racist and any Semite, and and yet that's like you know twentieth in the news cycle, right? <laughs> Just say used to be if the President of the United States shared a platform with one of the most vile human beings on earth in a country like Hungary during the war in Ukraine, it would be a thing. And yet it's what, 18, 19 on the news cycle? Right. And this, this is, this is our eternal struggle as journalists, you know, trying to like, what is the 1500th way we can talk about the craziness of what's going on? Well, okay. Speaking of the craziness, because I have come up with a 1500th way of talking about uh, the craziness, uh, you, you know, uh, this uh, Christian preacher, hate preacher named Greg Locke from uh, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Just so in case people had uh, missed this, I thought we would do this as a, as an opening palate cleanser to give some sense of what's happening out there in the in the world, sort of. I mean, look, part of me is is thinking this is still fringe stuff, but one of the lessons we have learned is that the fringe becomes the mainstream much faster than anybody can imagine. I mean, a few years ago, if you and I were talking, we'd talk about, well, here's some nut job talking about the replacement theory. Do we need to worry about that? Well, maybe not. Of course, we did need to worry about that. And we've seen this. So we have seen the uh, the rise of, uh, of Christian nationalism. Um, and Greg Locke is, uh, I think, one of the purest distillations of all of this. So in case you missed this, here is Pastor Locke from Tennessee making it clear that you cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. Here is the uh, the stylings of this man of the cloth. If you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You can get out, you baby butchering election thief. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons that butcher babies and hate this nation. Get mad all you want to. I don't care if you stand. I don't care if you throw tomatoes, praise God. I'm about to throw a microphone up in his house. CNN can eat my dirty socks. You cannot be a Democrat and a Christian. You cannot. Somebody say amen. 
The rest of you, get out. Get out. Hmm. Get out hmm. in the name of Jesus. I don't think that Jesus actually said stuff like that. I, I, I don't think that that will ever be confused with the Sermon on the Mount. But that is, that's just me. You yeah. know what I'm saying here? Okay, so that uh, just a little bit more in case you haven't had enough uh, uh, Greg Locke yet. Uh, he he uh, seems to be threatening uh, Democrats, the, 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 the Democrats who would stay. I'm, tr- you know, I'm sort of imagining that there are probably not a lot left in the congregation after the first, uh, you know, after the first segment. But uh, here's, uh, here, here's Greg Locke uh, threatening, threatening the Democrats. What's going to happen to them? Bunch of devils. <laughs> okay. I'm sick of it. They won't talk about the insurrection. Mm-mm. Mm. Let me tell you something. You ain't seen the insurrection yet. You keep on pushing our buttons, you low-down, sorry compromisers. You God-hating communist America. You'll find out what an insurrection is because we ain't playing your garbage. We ain't playing your mess. My Bible says that the church of the living God is an institution that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the Bible says that we'll take it by force. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. This would be the letter of uh, Paul to the uh, Oath Keepers. I I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Okay, so since it's Monday morning and because you want more of that sort of thing, in case you wonder whether he's just like you know, all on his own, there's a candidate for governor in Georgia, since we're going to be talking about Georgia, a, a Republican candidate for governor uh, named Candace Taylor, who um, gave a speech the other day at, at, a, at a rally when she has this big sign up, which, which I'm kind of fascinated by. The themes of her campaign, just three, three words, Jesus, guns, babies. <laughs> just really simple, Jesus, guns, babies. And I'm Kind of have that in front of me and want to meditate on that for a moment, because when I think of Jesus, I always think of guns, right? I mean, it's just like, it's like, what would, what would Jesus do? He would go get a fucking gun, right? I mean, he would, yeah, what? I just, I, you remember the, the, the story of a, Jesus goes into uh, the temple and shoots all the money lenders? <laughs> You 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 know you didn't get that. <laughs> okay, so oh, okay, so here here's Candace Taylor who is talking about how she will uh, handcuff sheriffs and execute them by firing squad. I mean, these people are not into subtlety; they're not into whistles anymore. It's like we are going to you elect me governor. We're going to arrest these sheriffs. We're going to kill them. Okay, here's Candace Taylor. We're not making backroom deals with sheriffs. They're the highest constitutional officer in their county. And they're going to do the will of the people. I don't mind handcuffing them either. So, I mean it. I've heard it from sheriff corruption all over the state. We've got some awesome sheriffs, and praise the Lord for them. Pray for them. Even if you have a corrupt one, pray for them. And pray that they're replaced really quickly if they're corrupt. Okay. But I don't care. Oh. I don't mind handcuffing any single person okay. who does who breaks the law and goes against our government. Goes against our government. The Constitution says... When you commit treason, it's death by firing squad. I didn't write it. It's It's in there. It's 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 serious. When you swear to God to uphold a document that says you'll do the will of the people and you will honor every single thing in that constitution, you do that. Yeah. See, we're laughing about this, uh, Will. But these people are out there. And if we've learned anything, it's like, you know, got to pay attention a little bit. So. There's been something going on, as we know, among Christians. But as I was talking to Tim Alberta about it, about what's been happening in evangelical churches, uh, it has been escalating exponentially and rapidly. I mean, this stuff is, I, I don't know, maybe I'm being too cynical, but this doesn't feel like it's going to end well. No, no. And and your your advice to take it seriously is is well taken because... That, I mean, Greg Locke used the term insurrection. There literally was an insurrection, right? So yeah. let's just remind ourselves this actually happened. And for people like me, who used to sort of just roll our eyes at this kind of rhetoric, um, I was rolling my eyes after the 2020 election, you know, uh, you know, but we have to stand up, rise up, you know, Lynn Wood, the crazy right wing lawyer in Georgia going around talking about it, it's 1776, right? And I thought it was all ridiculous. And then, you know, they stormed the Capitol. So, right. Y- right. So this is an, op- I mean, 
you, you've heard of resurrection Christianity. This is insurrection Christianity, and it's obviously it, very different in terms of being focused less on talking about Jesus and events that are alleged in Christianity to have happened that were about you know saving souls and and serving God. And now it's about a political uprising, and we just we've had a political up uprising. There will be more of this. People, this kind of rhetoric will provoke more people to follow these crazy ideas if we don't keep track of it. Well, yes, I mean, I, you know, ideas have consequences, and 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 the 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 spread of the rhetoric about how traitors need to be executed, the death penalty. I mean, this this has an effect that that our opponents are not are simply our opponents; they are our enemies. They hate God. They are traitors to the country. They should receive the death penalty. This is. I mean, I'm sorry, if this is not dangerous rhetoric, I don't know what is. So I, and, and we've seen this over and over again. And unfortunately, I suppose we should talk a little bit about the Republican flip-flop on domestic terrorism. I mean, it's a, it, it feels like it's old. It feels like it's unnecessary to have to, to say that, you know, these toxic ideas can have these deadly consequences. You know, we saw it in El Paso. We saw it at the, at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We, you know, we've seen it in Christchurch, New Zealand. We saw it in Buffalo. And yet there's no sense of like, oh my God, maybe we've gone too far. You know, maybe we ought to have this bipartisan consensus about pushing back on crazy, dangerous, deadly rhetoric. Not happening. Right, right. And that language about Jesus guns babies, right? The, the guns part of it is supposed to be, it is said by its advocates to be about protecting good, you know, law-abiding citizens from crime, right? But what we're seeing in, in the clips that you've just played is the gun stuff is not just about protecting law-abiding citizens. It is about an uprising. It is about a rising up against the government. It is about taking up arms and it becomes committing crimes in the case of these insurrections. I, you know, I mean, and, and it's a kind of Christianity that's, you know, as, as you're pointing out, like there is turn the other cheek Christianity, which is based on a fairly close reading of, of scripture. And then there's this load the other round Christianity, which is all, <laughs> all, all about, you know, uh, uh, violence and not just violence to protect, but violence to, to overturn and to take power. And so this violent form of Christianity, and it wouldn't matter, it wouldn't matter whether it is Christianity or Islam or Judaism, right? It is the violence that is dangerous. And anytime somebody takes a faith and turns it into a pretext for violence, that is a cause for all of us to, to take notice and to, and to speak out against it within our congregations. Those yep. people in Greg Locke's congregation have to speak up and hopefully they are. Well, or they're leaving. I mean, basically, he was not saying, let's talk about this. Let's not pray together about this. Let's not come together and reason. Uh, you need to get out. So I don't know that there's anybody left. So we don't have the bandwidth again uh, to uh, to talk about this uh, today on on today's podcast. But uh, the since we're we're talking about the crisis of the church, uh, the Southern Baptist apocalypse um, is truly extraordinary. Russell Moore, who's been on this podcast, uh, just sort of an amazing figure in evangelical Christianity, has uh, has a piece I, I excerpted in my newsletter today. Uh, about this new third-party independent report about sex abuse in uh, the Southern Baptist Convention. And he writes, they were right, I was wrong to call sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention a crisis because crisis is too small a word. It is an apocalypse. It is absolutely stunning. He says, as I read this report, I found I could not swipe the screen to the next page because my hands were shaking with rage. It's because as dark a view as I had of the SBC Executive Committee, the investigation uncovers a reality far more evil and, syst and systemic than I imagined it could be. So this is going on as well. Um, I, you know, and I, I think part of it is is the way in which the church at some point, and the church, and I mean different kinds of churches, including the Catholic Church, at some point become less focused on spreading the gospel or the faith than they do in protecting the institution or achieving power and their capacity to rationalize, which leads to cover-ups and abuse is, is truly stunning. And we're seeing it in one church after another. And this Southern Baptist story, in case people have not seen it, is truly, I mean, it is gobsmacking. It is stunning. It is, you think you know how bad it is. It's worse.
Right. And and meanwhile, while this is going on, Greg Locke is out there talking about he's talking about Republicans, rhino Republicans in his view, and he calls them crooked pedophile sex trafficking Republicans. So this QAnon bullshit is going on out in public while backstage actual sex abuse is happening, right? And and I think you've sort of put your finger on a very important point, which is that the the most dangerous kind of ideology in terms of sex trafficking is ideology that says everybody inside the institution, the leaders of our institution are inherently good and should not be questioned, right? If you don't agree with us, get out. All of our people are right. And what that does is it blunts scrutiny. It, it shields the institution from scrutiny. And when that happens, right, the abusers within the institution go unscrutinized and unpunished. Okay, so let's talk about the primaries and the elections. I think it is mildly good news that the Republican candidates for Senate in Pennsylvania are not listening to Donald Trump and claiming there was fraud. Dr. Oz, you know, did not prematurely declare victory. Politico quotes one longtime Republican consultant saying nobody's paying attention. Uh, this is the week that Republicans ignored Trump's education lies. Now, look, I mean, that's the absolute bare minimum. I mean, they act like reasonable human beings. And, okay, so I'm not going to throw them a, a parade. And we're also hearing now, by the way, that the uh, January 6th committee is about to hold the the hearings. But we also get these reports over the weekend uh, from the New York Times, you know, how Trump's 2020 election lies have gripped state legislatures. So this is not going away. And the RNC chairwoman, Ronna McDaniel, was uh, was on one of the Sunday shows yesterday. And I want to listen to uh, want to listen to uh, to her take. Let's play Ronna McDaniel. President Trump is right and others that we should not have no excuse absentee voting. This influx of mail-in voting is clearly showing that systems are not ready for that. And Pennsylvania is a case of that right now. And I think a lot of this lies at the foot of the feet of Governor Wolf, why we're having this disaster in Pennsylvania uh, right now. OK, <laughs> Will, I don't know what a disaster. I mean, we've had close elections in the past. We have had recounts again, but everything is going to be toxic going forward. So even at the moment in which the candidates themselves are not behaving badly, you have the RNC chairwoman saying, yep, can't do this. And we have another soundbite from her where she's basically saying there shouldn't be any uh, ballot drop boxes at all. And you've seen Georgia and Florida and Texas and other states pass comprehensive election reform that require voter ID for absentee ballots. That's just common sense. It's where most Americans are. They agree that we should show our ID to vote and Democrats don't uh, and get rid of ballot harvesting and get rid of drop mm -hmm. boxes and have same day voting. These are common sense measures that will ensure integrity in the election. And the problem is, Martha, Democrats want the Delta to be longer than ever. They want to vote earlier and then count the ballots as late as possible. So it's like a two month Delta. Okay, your thoughts, Will? Okay, a couple of things. First of all, I do want to talk about Oz and McCormick because I think that's really interesting. But on McDaniel, what she says in that interview is really interesting because it's very much in sync with Donald Trump. And I want people to understand the difference here. She's not just talking, and Trump isn't just talking about voter ID, right? There's actually broad agreement, including in Pennsylvania, about some form of voter identification, including for absentee ballots, right? What the, she's talking about, as she says, reducing the delta, reducing the amount, the, the, the window, the, the time window for voting, right? We want it to be narrower. And she says we, it should be same day voting. This is Trump's position, right? You should basically only be allowed to vote on election day unless you have I mean, produced some time. Now, Charlie, I vote in Maryland and I have voted early voting the last couple of times I've gone. And it's great. You walk in, it is in-person voting. There's no fraud issue, right? It's not different from voting on election day. It's just that if you can't vote on election day, like for example, you are a working person. You have to go to a shift on election day. You can go in on a weekend, the week earlier or the week, week before that, and you are voting in person. It's totally you, but it just makes it possible for you to, the fact that Ronna McDaniel and Donald Trump are going after um, the the time window and are trying to narrow and trying to get rid of drop boxes, even if they're monitored, shows you that they're not just about voter ID. They're trying to make it harder to vote. They're trying to reduce the time in which you can vote and make it harder for working people to vote. And that is absolutely outrageous. It also seems kind of pointless. I mean, the fact it, but see, part of it is is they're trying to confuse the early voting with fraud. You know, and, and, and this is something if you notice this happens again and again and again, you know, ballot harvesting, which basically is allowing somebody to collect legal ballots that have been cast. And they, those are not fraudulent. You can have a debate about that back and forth. But let me just read you a little interesting tidbit that I, I'm hoping that our listeners find at least somewhat surprising. 
It's it's a Washington Post story out of Georgia, uh, where they're, of course, voting tomorrow. When a Spalding County Board of Elections, uh, when the Spalding County Board of Elections eliminated early voting on Sundays, Democrats blamed a new state law and accused Republican controlled uh, the Republican controlled board of intentionally thwarting souls to the polls, a get out the vote program among black churches uh, to urge their congregations to cast ballots after religious services. This was a big, big, big controversy. But the Washington Post reports, after three weeks of early voting ahead of Tuesday's primary, record-breaking turnout is undercutting predictions that the Georgia Election Integrity Act of 2021 would lead to a fall-off in voting. By the end of Friday, the final day of early in-person voting, nearly 800,000 Georgians had cast ballots more than three times the number in 2018 and higher even than in 2020, a presidential year. Uh, Voting rights groups and Democrats say they have changed their strategies to mobilize voters under the new rules in Spalding County, for instance. Local activists moved souls to the polls to a Saturday, and they defiantly promised they would work twice as hard if that is what it took to protect voter access. Okay, so that's good. But I guess it is worth noting that a lot of the apocalyptic rhetoric about vote suppression has not actually turned out to be a description of what's actually happened. The reality is not what was feared. Right. And honestly, I think the Georgia law was misrepresented by Democrats. Mm-hmm. I think it, I mean, it was also misrepresented. The Republicans tried as hard as they could to make it look like it, they were just ramming this down everybody's throat and it was going to su- suppress votes. But that that law is actually a decent law and, the, and it, including that it does allow for early voting. Um, so yeah, I, I, so in the spirit of honesty, can I, can I come back to Pennsylvania for one second? The, the, I think as a general rule, it is very healthy when you're having an argument about, uh, some sort of standard, some sort of rule about like when you can vote, for example, or when ballots should be counted. It's very healthy for the parties to find themselves switched, to find themselves on opposite, like you're on one side of it, but then on some occasion, the, the context may be different and you're on the other side of it. And now you can see what the other point of view is like. So this fight between Mehmet Oz and David McCormick is very interesting because now we have a Republican, McCormick, who is in what was the Democratic position of wanting all the ballots to be counted, right? And for <laughs> arguing for a, a looser definition, right? Like there are ballots out there, they're in envelopes. And sometimes the date isn't clearly marked on it. Is that the person's fault? Is it the government's fault? Should those ballots be counted? And so, you know, it's it, it's Oz, of course, is now arguing the the sort of Trumpy side of it. Don't count any more ballots because he's ahead now. McCormick is sort of on the other side, and the, and the McCormick campaign wants these ballots to be counted. So that's a useful thing for Republicans to see. Sometimes you do want the ballots to be counted because it, it's your ballots, right? And can I just point out on this subject, this is a beautiful illustration of the absolute moral emptiness of Donald Trump, who on Tuesday night of the Prince Pennsylvania primary was not saying that the, we should stop the count because his guy, Oz, was behind. But by Wednesday, Oz was ahead. And suddenly Donald Trump is talking about the other side finding ballots, you know, fake ballots, when, you know, he, just the day before he was on the other side of that principle. So Trump has no principles at all. And whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you should, you should choose a principle and stick to it. The principle that I choose is count all the votes. Okay, so let's. Uh, we, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Georgia. What is about to happen? Uh, also, uh, I want to ask you about your tweet this morning about the uh, GOP having a racism problem. And of course, we haven't weighed in on uh, the baby formula crisis yet. Let's do all of that after this. Summer's right around the corner, and Genucel is celebrating early with their summer clearance sale. Now save over 60% on Genucel's most popular package at Genucel.com. Order today and get Genucel's dark spot corrector to visibly reduce those pesky dark sunspots for free. Here's another Genucel success story from Cynthia H. from Arlington, Virginia. After using Genucel products, my husband said, you look young. Whatever you're doing is working. He didn't know about Genucel. I like the texture and not too strong of a smell. Products are easy to use and fine for my sensitive skin. I've tried expensive products and Genucel is the best. The results are real. Millions of Americans are in love. Genucel guarantees results or your money back. And sign up for Genucel's best-in-class rewards program at checkout for an extra 10% off your order and complimentary gift set. 
Go to GeniusL.com slash Bulwark for 60% off. GeniusL.com slash Bulwark. Enter Bulwark at checkout for an extra 20% off. And right now, our most popular package includes GenuCell's immediate effects for results in as little as 12 hours. Go to GenuCell.com slash Bulwark. That's GenuCell.com slash Bulwark. Okay, we are back with Will Salatan. I am not into uh, irrational exuberance uh, or wish casting, but uh, I have to say that I'm uh, I'm, I'm going to take what, uh, what satisfaction I can from what's about to happen to Donald Trump in Georgia, where his candidate is going to be shellacked tomorrow. David Perdue, the former senator who really, you know, talk about, you know, everything Trump touches dies. He was behind in the latest poll by 30 points. Who knows what the actual result will be? Trump went all out on all of this. He recruited Purdue. He called him. You know, he begged him to run. He put in a bunch of his own pack money into all of it, and it's been a complete and total failure. And you know, apparently Trump figured, you know, that that he was he had the magic touch that it would be enough for him to, if he endorsed David Purdue to get rid of Brian Kemp, who was a very Trumpy conservative Republican governor, simply because he refused to uh, overturn the election, and it's backfiring badly on him. And again, this doesn't mean that. That Donald Trump, you know, is not still in control of the Republican Party doesn't mean he, he's not likely to be the nominee. But tomorrow is going to be really probably his worst defeat since November 2020. Your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, what this case illustrates, the, the Georgia race, like other races Trump has been in, there is no principle involved in Donald no, Trump's none. endorsement Zero. or not, right? The only principle is, do you did you support Donald Trump in his lies about the 2020 election, right? Uh, and so there, because there's no principle, you have other Republicans like Mike Pence who are like doing the normal thing. We're supporting the Republican incumbent. Kemp is the, the incumbent. Same thing in Idaho, another case you pointed to, right? So there's no principle. Secondly, let's be clear about this. Donald Trump's endorsements are a trailing indicator, right? They are not. Donald Trump, he, he does help you get, you know, he, there are MAGA voters out there. They, Trump endorses you. They will vote for you, right? But by and large, Trump is not going to do that unless he thinks you're going to win, right? So right. he's not causing your victory so much as following it. And he just made the wrong bet in Georgia, right? And, and, and what we're seeing is that, in, in fact, I believe that Kemp's margin has gone from like 10 points to 30 in the time since Trump endorsed Purdue. So, right. you know. Well, well, exactly. And, and he's, um, as Amanda Carpenter has a great piece in, uh, in the, in the bulwark today where she talks about, uh, you know, the fact that he is, you know, he's completely AWOL now on the trail. I mean, no, he's nowhere to be seen, uh, in, in Georgia's last appearance was on March 26th when he made what was described as a rescue mission to resuscitate David Perdue. So he canceled other visits and he's going to do a tele rally tonight. Who knows whether he's going to throw him under the bus. By the way, one of the other more interesting stories, it was kind of off my radar screen um, until last week. Uh, Mo Brooks, who was who was dumped by Trump, who was originally endorsed by by Trump and then dumped when it looked like he wasn't winning. He's apparently sort of coming back without Trump. Remember, Mo Brooks was the guy that actually wore a bulletproof vest January 6th and said, we're going to you know, kick ass and take names. And he was all super, super Trump. And he was going to be Trump's candidate. And then Trump dumped him. Um, and then Mo Brooks came out and said, well, he dumped me because I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't go along with his plans to immediately remove Joe Biden from office and reinstall him as president. I mean, so, you know, his story was that Donald Trump was asking me to do stuff that was too crazy even for me. And you kind of figured that was it for the Mo Brooks story, right? You know, crazy, 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 did everything for, for Trump, um, gets thrown under the bus, forget him. He's apparently coming back now without Trump, which would, would also be what a strange and wild ride in Republican primaries these days. Yeah, and, and uh, you know what? All of these cases just remind me the term rhino, right? The term rhino, Republican in name only. The rhinos are the Trump candidates, right? In the sense that Trump isn't endorsing these candidates because they're more conservative than the other candidate in the primary. They're more Republican, that they adhere more to like what was in the Republican platform of years gone by, right? It's all about personal loyalty to Trump, right? So there is no... It, 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 they're they're all Republicans, but the ones Trump is endorsing are the ones like J.D. Vance who are willing to chuck over a half the platform in the service of uh, fealty to one man, to Trump. So those are the rhinos. Okay, so baby formula. 
you had some thoughts about baby formula, globalism, and capitalism, <laughs> Will. Yeah. Okay. So like the, all right, the, you know, God willing, the baby formula crisis will pass soon. The Abbott plant will be back up and babies will be able to get their formula. Right. But the, the way that this happened is like, I think this is a useful situation for us to think about effective capitalism, right? We have a capitalist system. It is supposed to deliver what people need. Who, what is more needed than baby formula? Literally infants need this to survive, right? So we, we've we got like a, a, obviously a huge monopoly problem in the baby formula industry. We have one in the meatpacking industry too. It's just that bacon isn't as important as baby formula. And we, we've got to figure out how to make these markets work so that we don't end up with these terrible shortages. And that requires competition, right? So that's capitalism. But it has to be effective capitalism. It has to be like properly regulated, but not overregulated, right? Like we do need antitrust, but Republicans tend not to be so great on antitrust because, like, you know, what is the first thing that a that a private player in the marketplace will do if left if left to its own devices by the government? It will drive everyone else out of the market, right, and try to hold it to itself. But in this case, we have a government monopoly on the baby formula. It's the government is the big purchaser. So right. I think this is an opportunity for a lot of conversation among left and right about how to make capitalism work, how to make it resilient. Yeah. So in many ways, though, this is not a failure of capitalism. It is a failure of government regulation and shows how government regulation and trade policy can distort the marketplace and lead to something like this. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, no, I, I agree with that. But but the, the distortions have come from both sides here. The tariffs, for example. Tariffs? Right? That we, yeah. We have, we have, we've, got to, we've got tariffs on the Europeans. Uh, we've, we've kind of blocked them out of our market. I mean, we have this idea that we need to have like stronger supply chains and the way we're going to do it is by making everything in America. And that is just wrong, right? Because we do want to have enough in America so that if we're blocked out from foreign goods, we can, we can produce it ourselves. But we don't want it to all the foreign goods to be so blocked from the American market that when, you know, one American manufacturer goes down as happened here, we don't have a supply. I mean, we're, Charlie, we're sending military planes over to Europe. Crazy. We're flying baby formula back in here, right? Because, because we, we don't have it here. What, what, there should have already been a pipeline. There should already be a market share for foreign companies so that if something like this happens, we have alternatives. Well, this is, again, one of the, the unintended consequences of, of, of government policies and regulations. So, I mean, I'm reading this, the really excellent piece in The Atlantic about all of this, about the regulatory and trade uh, policies. FDA regulations of the formula are so stringent that most of the stuff that comes out of Europe is illegal to buy here due to technicalities like labeling requirements. One study found that most of these European formulas meet the nutritional guidelines and in some ways are even better than American formula because the European Union bans certain sugars like corn syrup. But, you know, the FDA being the FDA has come up with all kinds of reasons why we can't import it. And then we also, as you point out, you know, restrict the importation of the formula that does meet these requirements. The tax on formula imports can exceed 17 percent. And here's another one of the legacies of Donald Trump. The U.S. entered into this new North American trade agreement that actively and intentionally discouraged formula imports from our largest trading partner, Canada. So in many ways, this is a government manufactured crisis. Um, as you also point out, one of the reasons why there are so few manufacturers is because the government only buys the formula from certain companies and therefore totally distorts the free market. So in, in some ways, we don't have a free market when it comes to this. And we're seeing what happens when the market is not allowed to function. Yes. And those FDA rules, I mean, I'm glad you pointed to those. Those are fake safety rules. I mean, those are those regulations are nominally for the sake of safety. But as you're pointing out, it's not rational from that standpoint. Those are protectionism. Those are protecting the American manufacturers. And when, you know, you, you can tell yourself that thereby, you know, you're protecting domestic industry and making sure we're safe from the foreigners. The foreigners are not the problem. The foreigners here are literally the solution <laughs> when we're like using our military to go get Swiss baby formula, right? That So that it, it, what we need is balance, right? You need like a, an economy with a resilient economy has multiple sources of every product. Yeah. Some are domestic, some are foreign. So, and when the Republican Party abandoned its position on free trade and became as protectionist, more protectionist than the Democratic Party, we ended up with some of these terrible policies. 
Correct. Okay, so I want to ask you about your tweet this morning. You're, you're citing uh, this new survey, this new uh, YouGov uh, survey that finds that, you know, when people are asked, is the changing racial diversity in the United States generally good, bad, or neither? Among Republicans, only 20% say it's good. 34%, more than a third, say it is bad. Uh, 45% say neither. So then when uh, they are asked, how important is it for political leaders to condemn white nationalism and white supremacy? Only 23% of Republicans said very important. Only 29% said somewhat important. 48%, nearly half, said it's not very or not at all important for political leaders to condemn white nationalism and white supremacy. So your conclusion is that Republicans have a racism problem. Yeah, you know, this is a, this is a topic that I've discussed with our colleague Ted Johnson, and Ted has talked about something called the racial resentment scale, right? Which in scholarly literature, like, uses a bunch of poll questions and in, in, imputes. Yeah, okay. So I, I've social you, science I, bullshit, gobbledy, <laughs> gobbledygook. You'll but be having no Ted. Ted agrees with you. Okay, yeah, just to be just to be clear, yeah. Ted, and and Ted's point of view about the, this, it's not really racial resentment that's being measured. It's attitudes about who's res, to what extent is some a, a group responsible for you know its 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 situation economically whatever. But the, the real these questions in this CBS poll are measuring actual racial resentment. Right. This is that's kind of what's interesting here. It's they have the question, the usual question about, you know, do immigrants make American society better or worse? And they find that most Republicans say it makes America worse. But then you can, you know, Republicans could still say, oh, we're, we're just talking about immigration in general. It's not an ethnic thing. But these questions, well, racial diversity read, is the word. Right. Yeah. So CBS <laughs> did a good job here. They ask literally, is the changing racial diversity good or bad? And you can say neither. You can say neither. And a lot of Republicans said neither. But when 34 percent of the party is saying that the racial diversity per se is bad. Right. That is a pretty good measure of what you could call racial resentment or racial fear or racial uh, animus. Right. And, and the one about white nationalism, how important is it to condemn white nationalism? You could just contrast the Republican number there, like what 48 percent of Republicans say, not very important to speak up about that. I haven't looked, Charlie, but what do you think the number is for Republicans saying that we should speak up about jihadist ideology that leads to this kind of violence? I mean, by the way, th that's a very interesting point, because I remember for years on a daily basis, this was the mantra when when President Obama was in office, that conservatives and I was one of them who said, why can't you just use the phrase radical Islamic terrorism? You know, call it what it is. And yet I'm not sure you can find any you know, prominent conservative Republican leader who talks about, you know, white supremacist uh, terrorism, white nationalist terrorism, um, racist extremism, anti-Semitic extremism and violence. They won't say it. And so, I mean, the contrast is pretty blatant. Yeah. And and can I point out in addition to that? So it's one thing for Republicans to say, look, white nationalism isn't really that big a thing. OK, you know, there's a bunch of guys shooting their guns out in the hills, but it's not this. This poll was taken after Buffalo. This is polls taken after there have been like, you know, four or five big mass shootings based on white nationalism that we know about in the last, you know, five or six years. And for for. For so many Republicans, after all of that, after the violence and the killing, to say, you know, it's still not that big a deal, that tells you that they're just, they refuse to face the terrorism when it comes from their own ranks. Well, I think that's that's demonstrably true. So I think you have a, a two-edged problem here. Number one is you have a real racism problem. There's no question about it. I mean, the reality, and I don't, I don't know how to quantify, you know, what goes on in people's hearts and minds, but there's also a very significant indifference problem an unwillingness to even talk about it. And I think this is the real problem, is that there's now been created so much blowback on the right that there's not even a willingness to engage in a dialogue or a discussion about it or to acknowledge that it is a problem. I mean, the reality is, I mean, how do you, I want to kind of underline this, how a week after 10 people are massacred in Buffalo by an overtly, explicitly racist domestic terrorist, a homegrown, radicalized bigot, can you say that it's not important, not, a, not really important to condemn white nationalism and white, white supremacy, except to say that there, there, there's become this just unwillingness to acknowledge any problem. And so this is an interesting shift since, uh, you know, the George Floyd killing. Because I remember a reporter called me up in the, in the few days after the George Floyd case. And, and when, when the country was kind of coming together 
and saying, hey, we really have a problem here. This is wrong. She said, do you think that this is going to be a, a, a turning point for the right? And I was like, no. I said, give it 48 hours. They will revert to the law and order position. But there has been a huge uh, blowback. And you have the charlatans like Christopher Rufo decided that they are going to uh, play the culture war card on critical race theory, which I think is, you know, uh, again, there's a legitimate debate to be had about critical race theory. But what's happened is it's morphed into a resistance of any sort of acknowledgement that we have a racist problem. And I don't know how to break that. I don't know how to break that particular thing. I mean, again, this is something that's been coming for a long time, but it is accelerating. And I guess I would push back against people on the left who say it's always been this way. No, I think you do need to distinguish between what is new and what is old. And I, in, in retrospect, you may think that Republicans were giving lip service to endorsement of diversity or just lip service to, you know, saying that we're a multicultural society. But at this point, we need at least more lip service. And we're not even getting that anymore. No. So obviously, a lot of people on the right, a lot of Republicans get upset at the phrase Black Lives Matter. And they say, look, we know Black Lives Matter, but it's all lives matter. And they think that there's something sort of pushy and selfish about making it a black thing as opposed to an everybody thing. This is what people are getting at when they say Black Lives Matter. What they mean is do not look away. Do not act like it's not important when the 10 or 12 people who are murdered are black, right? You would be furious if this were an is I mean, this country has like gone on fire when an Islamic terrorist has killed a bunch of white people. And, you know, it's understood that, look, there's, there's stories about the, you know, the victims and that's viewed as an attack on this could happen to any one of us. We have to think about murders of Latino people in Texas or Jews in Pennsylvania or black people in Buffalo, New York as us. They're all us. We are us. And that's what the phrase Black Lives Matter is. And when I see this number, 48 percent of Republicans don't think this is a big deal. That, t- that tells me there is a blind spot. And that's what the Black Lives Matter movement is getting at. So one last point. We probably should keep our powder dry on uh, Roe versus Wade because that's coming down and that's going to suck all the oxygen out of the room. I'm sorry, I got I to gotta use a different cliche than sucking the oxygen <laughs> out of the room. This is the part of the problem is because we're caught in this loop. We keep using the same stuff over and over again. And I, I'm very conscious of that. So, you know, bust me on that when I do that. You were struck by a soundbite yesterday from uh, the governor of Arkansas, Asa Hutchison, who is uh, not a totally bad guy, who signed into law a bill, you know, radically restricting abortion without any sort of an exemption for rape. And this is what he had to say about it yesterday. If Roe versus Wade is reversed, these are going to become very real circumstances. I yes. think the debate and discussion will be will continue, and and uh, that very well could be revisited. But Governor, what if it can't be? I mean, you 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 wanted the legislature in Arkansas to put those exceptions in. They didn't. Your term is almost up. What makes you think you can change it? And and if you can't, that means that. People who are still women who girls who are still children, 11 and 12 year olds might be in this situation in a very real way in just a couple of months, potentially. Well, those are heartbreaking circumstances. And that's where in uh, the last few years, when we passed these trigger laws, we're expressing a a, a belief. Uh, belief. We're trying to return that authority to the states and to reduce abortions. But whenever you see real life circumstances like that, that debate is going to continue and the will of the people may or may not change. So he signed the law to express a belief, but then he understands that a wait, wow, this could be like a real life thing here. Um, Right. He didn't put out a press release. They passed a criminal law. And now he's like, this, uh, this might be a problem if uh, the criminal law I sign actually goes into effect. I literally stood up out of my chair when he said, we're expressing a belief, right? I mean, they literally banned abortion, even in cases of rape or incest, which which Hutchison, to his credit, says like it was wrong, right? We shouldn't have done that. But he signs it anyway, because at that point, Roe is still the law of the land. And, you know, we're just using law as expression. And, you know, conservatives love to talk about liberals doing virtue signaling. This is a kind of virtue signaling on the right. We're going to pass a criminal law because we feel that we should 
express some pro-life sentiment, uh, you know, go out, you know, carry a banner, say you're pro-life, right? Uh, push the, the cause, but do not sign a criminal law that will literally, you know, jail doctors for doing abortions in the case of rape or incest. If you do not intend to enforce it, the criminal law is for enforcement. It is not for expression. It is very serious business. Okay, so you know we started off talking about you know major stories that were not uh, were barely in the top twenty of uh, the uh, of of the news cycle. Uh, the New York Times this morning has and again we're not going to be able to get into it, but New York Times has this amazing story about uh, the way that Jared Kushner and uh, Steve Mnuchin, the former Treasury Secretary, uh, are cashing in on their contacts in the Middle East. Uh, you know, huge contracts that. The, the the suggestion is that they were cultivating many of these contacts while they were in office, while they were in positions of power. And, you know, on Earth 2.0, this would be a massive conflict of interest scandal. And my guess is it's going to barely register. What do you think? Yeah, because it's traditional. Sorry, uh, you you were giving me crap last week about saying I come from a democratic background, but from my point of view, this is this is traditional Republican corruption. It's not like the new Republican corruption of like violently trying to overthrow the United States government. This is like people in business. Okay, and to be fair, people in democratic politics have done this too, right? You get you get into K Street, you get into sort of a corporate life, and you Clintons. You, <laughs> you, <laughs> <laughs> Bill, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> right, right. Okay, all right. In the spirit, in the spirit of like honesty, will like this. This is a universal problem, but this there is this Crooks notion like Rod, out there. Rod Bogoyevich. <laughs> right. Oh wait. No, no sorry. I, sorry. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But like the the <laughs> pose the pose of the Trump Republican Party that they've become the party of the working class. Oh, the is slum. Com- uh, yeah, Jesus. It's complete garbage, and this illustrates that you know they're just as much you know, about rich people enriching themselves further and using their government service, quote unquote, to do it as they ever were. I guess, look, Hunter Biden's story is not completely bogus. I mean, let's let's concede this. It, it, there, there, are, there are elements of sleaze that are extremely disturbing. And I, for one, will never vote for Hunter Biden for president and would object strongly for Hunter Biden to receive, you know, be in any position of, of public trust. Hunter Biden is not a top aide in the White House. He is not in charge of Middle East policy in the White House. He is not in charge of criminal justice reform in the White House. He is not the secretary of the Treasury. And if he was, it would be an outrage. Um, so, I mean, this is part of the this weird world where Trump world is actually now pretending to have a set of ethics involving someone who has never served in government while we are getting story after story after story of Jared Kushner essentially, you know, you know, manipulating his position, pivoting from government role to making money. And I, I don't know, it's just that, it, you know, again, uh, if you're looking for any sort of consistency of principle, good luck, because it's not going to happen. So. Yeah. And, and can I point out, these are the guys, the Kushners, the Mnuchins, you know, uh, the Wall Street types who were in the Trump administration. These were the guys we were counting on to protect us from Trump himself and from the, uh, the, the, the crazier people in the administration in the Republican Party. They're, these were like the old, the, just the old fashioned sort of, you know, corrupt business types. And they're showing us that that's the corruption that they practice. Yeah. So anything else you are watching this week that you're particularly interested in? I, I have to say that I am absolutely fascinated by the primary elections in Georgia to see what happens here and what and what the former guy's reaction is. I think it will be unusually delicious. Yeah. Uh, well, my annual pitch, this is this is totally unrelated. The English Premier League wrapped up its season yesterday. And my annual pitch that American sports leagues should end the practice of rewarding teams for doing poorly, right? I mean, I'm a Houston Rockets fan. They're just get, they're going to get another top three pick in the NBA draft as a reward for sucking for yet another year, right? In the English Premier League, the bottom three teams in the of the 20, they're relegated. They're sent to a lower league, right? And there's nothing- I, I, I know this because I watched Ted Lasso. <laughs> this is how yeah, I know so- this. God bless Ted Lasso, whose whose message, of course, is that you come back up, but you don't always come back up. But there's something sort of exhilarating about the thrill of, you know, there will be consequences for poor performance. Uh, I don't love everything about the Premier League, the fact that rich teams can buy the richest players and there's all all kinds of economic differences between the, the best and the worst teams. But the idea that you are punished for doing poorly at the end of the year instead of rewarded, I kind of love that. 
See, I figured you would be one of these guys who would say, okay, competition's overrated. Everybody should receive a participation trophy, right? Blue ribbons and happy faces for everybody, right? Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I, I, I guess I, I, I kind of have libertarian instincts here. I, I would say, and to, to be sort of a centrist Democrat here, right? I would, uh, I think you should be relegated, but I also think that like the system that we have in base in American baseball or that we've have in sort of English football is, you know, w where you can just, oh, just blow somebody away with your payroll. I would like to see some ways of preventing that, but I do think bad management should be punished, not rewarded. Yeah. What a radical concept. Will, thank you for joining me again. We will talk again next Monday. Appreciate it. Thanks, Charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again. Just getting started with Susie Schuster has stories of humble beginnings and humbling moments from inspiring people. Angela Kinsey. Listen, I, I was on set one day on The Office and I was like, we were talking about what's your good Switch. side. And I said, there's nothing really to that, right? That's like, oh, no, there is. And our camera operator, Matt Stone, that I had known for eight years, and I go, Matt, what's my side? He was like, this side. I was like, seriously? Oh. He goes, yeah. He goes, I always try to frame you that way. I was like, why didn't you tell me seven years ago? The new Just Getting Started with Susie Schuster. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.